Hi, and welcome to Interprofessional Education at an Assistive Technology Camp. My name is Dr. Allison Kreger, and this is a research project that was done by two of our graduates, Ryan Casper and David Ritchie. The purpose of this project was to address the lack of awareness and confidence in interprofessional education among healthcare students at Camp Gizmo, an assistive technology camp. Uh, this topic was of increasing interest to the program and the students due to the fact that the Commission on Accreditation and Physical Therapy Education now requires interprofessional experiences and education for programs to be accredited to offer doctoral physical therapy pro um, degrees. The hypothesis that was developed was whether or not there would be measurable increases in confidence, communication, and awareness of the educational aspects of other health science fields among the student participants at Camp Gizmo. What is Camp Gizmo? Camp Gizmo is a five day long assistive technology camp where families with children needing assistive technology come together with professionals to help problem solve. This camp incorporates labs to offer interaction with a wide variety of professionals and types of assistive technology. Education is provided to families and professionals regarding what different professions offer and what types of assistive technology are available. Healthcare students such as occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech language pathology students attend to reinforce learning of pediatric development and care. During this time, students interact with one another to problem solve and learn about one another's programs and professions. The methodology of this research was a qualitative study design. 60 healthcare students attending Camp Gizmo were invited to participate in the study. The students were all members of either occupational therapy, physical therapy, or speech and language pathology programs. Of the 60 uh, students who were invited to participate, 11 participated in returning both the pre and post surveys, nine physical therapy students and two occupational therapy students. The methods includes the, included the use of the Interprofessional Collaborative Competencies and Attainment Survey or ICCAS that was administered via Google survey, both before and after the participation at Camp Gizmo. The ICCAS or Interprofessional Collaborative Competencies Attainment Survey was used to assess areas of competency and comfort students had with interprofessional work with the other students at camp. The main areas assessed with the ICCAS include communication, collaboration, roles and responsibilities, collaborative family and family center, or collaborative patient and family centered approach, conflict management and resolution and team functioning. Statistics were run using SPSS. Pre-camp versus post-camp responses on the ICCAS were compared. A mixed ANOVA was also used to compare the pre- and post-camp post scores by profession as well. When looking at these results, significant changes were found between the pre- and post-camp scores on the ICCAS on the following. The most, the most significant changes were found on these four questions. Before and after participating in the learning activities, I am able to express my ideas and concerns without being judgmental. Before and after participating in the learning activities, I am able to identify and describe my abilities and contributions to the interprofessional team. Before and after participating in the learning activities, I am able to be accountable for my contributions to the interprofessional team. And before, or before and after participating in the learning activities, I am able to actively listen to the perspectives of the interprofessional team members. Significant positive difference was found across the board with all the responses with the, the pre versus post camp participation assessments. There was no significant difference noted between with the ANOVA between the different students of different professional programs or physical therapy versus occupational therapy. One of the main things that was noticed with the subjective questions that the students were asked along with the ICCAS results was that students demonstrated an increase of confidence in their competencies with working with other professions. These are the references. 
And the takeaway from Camp Gizmo was that they hope to continue working with students of interprofessional programs to increase competency and confidence in working with interprofessional teams in the clinic. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica Presbrin Peterson and Emma Friesen is also an engineer that works with me and we wanted to share our protocol for some research we're planning on completing. Um, this is generating evidence for a mobile shower commode chair and it's a study protocol. Emma Friesen is an engineer. She works full-time for RAS Design and I'm a consultant for RAS Design and RAS Design is presenting this research. The aims of this study and the reason why we're doing this is because um, RAS advertises that pressure changes um, when different aspects of the shower chair are put into optimal positions. And we wanted to make sure that we had evidence to prove that. And so first we're gonna test the efficacy of the adjustable devices on it so that it will increase pressure distribution, provide postural support and enhance function. And then we wanted to identify validated and feasible outcome measurements that capture these objectives of effectiveness and then show clinical evidence for any kind of stakeholders. So users, clinicians, suppliers, funders, and policymakers. We have several hypotheses, as you can see. Um, the first is that we wanted to show that pressure mapping scores with uh, underneath the ischial tuberosities will be decreased with tilt. Then we wanted to show that the foot rests have to be in the right place. And so we're gonna adjust them to what we feel is the optimal position and then raise them two or three inches and show the differences in those pressure mapping scores. And then a lot of individuals with spinal cord injury are using this um, shower chair to reach underneath the cushion um, for digital stimulation. And so we wanted to demonstrate the difference between having a cutout on the side, which requires less reach and less bending to not having a cutout on the side. And we'll take pressure mapping of that. And then also we're looking at functional abilities for completing bowel and bladder um, routine. And we'd be working with the individuals to talk about that and getting some personal input. The methodology required 90 participants, and we were going to be using the standard um, RAS seat and then the visco foam interface seat and show the differences between that and then uh, what we just talked about with the hypothesis. And so we'll be using pressure mapping, we'll be using a usability um, access, and then we'd be um, also asking about pain. So did pain change when we changed positions? So our methodology will begin with the uh, MSCC being upright and the client will be positioned in an upright position and then we'll adjust the footrest and the armrest and the seat position. The seat has what we call an eye pass that goes underneath the ischial tuberosities to clear them. Then we're gonna tilt the MSCC 20 degrees and take that pressure map, 40 degrees and take that pressure map and we'll adjust the blocks um, if we can't adjust the footrest to be three inches higher. Then we're gonna take the flip, the footrest and flip them and leave the feet unsupported to simulate the footrest being too low or non-supported at all. Then what we're gonna do is have the individual reach underneath the seat to simulate uh, digital stimulation and um, press upwards to uh, simulate that so that we can actually assess what the pressure is in those positions. Emma Friesen, who was working with me on this grant, developed an assessment tool that looks at user um, rated usability when they're using the shower chair. And we're gonna be using that to be able to ask questions. And then lastly, we're gonna use the numerical pain rating scale before the intervention begins and afterwards to find out if there's any decrease in pain at all. The changes that we've made um, because of this, and this is not going to be on the um, assessment of this poster, is that um, because of COVID, we're not using individuals with disabilities in hospitals because we can't get into those sites. Um, where I work at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, it's a conflict of interest for me to do the testing there because the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab purchases these systems for their um, inpatient use, and then they recommend 
for outpatients and people that are leaving the facility. So um, we've changed our protocol a little bit and now we're gonna be working with 90 uh, individuals who go to Governor State University, they're physical therapists, occupational therapists, and then students that have disabilities that attend that school. Um, so now we're not doing usability because our uh, students may not have disabilities and we're not using the pain scale. So it's strictly pressure mapping, but please understand when you um, do this uh, before and after uh, assessment for the poster that you look at what we were going to do originally because this was developed before um, COVID hit. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for your interest in our poster titled Ultralight Wheelchair for Individuals with Stroke, a Preliminary Study. I will be presenting this poster. My name is Sujay Galen, and joining me today is my colleague, Dr. Emily Buckman, giving this presentation. I would also acknowledge our co-authors, Dr. Jordan Norris and Dr. Amber Weiss and Dr. Catherine A. McLeod. So let's start with the motivation to do the study. There are over 7 million stroke survivors that are currently estimated to be living in the United States. Almost half of these individuals at discharge require mobility using a wheelchair. And oftentimes with stroke comes impairments of using their upper extremity. So their use of a wheelchair is not the most optimal pattern. And 40% of the stroke survivors use manual wheelchair following discharge from the hospital, even when they're back home, and again, they already having all these cardiovascular issues makes it even more difficult for them to use these wheelchairs to go about doing their activities of daily living. So the problem here really is that suboptimal wheelchair propulsion pattern that has been previously reported, but also that's something we clinically observe in individuals with stroke. And so far, when we looked at the literature, there's just one study that's looked at individuals using ultralight wheelchairs Therefore, there's very limited research on the benefit of an ultralight wheelchair for individuals with stroke. Therefore, the purpose of this investigation is to look at the impact of an ultralight wheelchair design on wheelchair skills and performance in healthy individuals and also individuals with stroke. As far as this poster is concerned, we will be primarily uh, presenting our healthy individual data because our stroke data is being collected as we speak. Now over to Dr. Buckman. So our hypothesis for this presentation and study was that measures of wheelchair performance, such as the wheelchair skills test and the wheelchair propulsion test will be significantly different for ultralight wheelchairs compared to a standard wheelchair. And here in this image, you can see the ultralight wheelchair, um, just an image of that we, a sample one that we used in the study, and then also the standard wheelchair here on the right hand side. So the data we'll be reporting is about four healthy individuals with a rough age of around 25 years old. And the, um, we had them fitted to a wheelchair, each of those wheelchairs, and they were given about five minutes or so to get acclimated to the wheelchair. They were able to wheel around freely in the clinic to become accustomed to it before testing. And then they were asked to propel the wheelchair using only their dominant arm. And so they were asked to simulate a hemiparesis for the healthy, healthy individuals. And so our outcome measures were the shortened wheelchair skills test. And in that, the maneuvers that we looked at were forward and backward propulsion, maneuvering around objects, turning in place, coming to a halt quickly, and picking up objects. And you can see here in this image, so, um, this individual is working on picking up objects from the floor. And we used these um, little plastic cones as the barriers for some of the maneuvering skills in the lab. And then for the wheelchair propulsion test, we looked at the number of propulsive cycles, the elapsed time that was spent wheeling down a short distance, and then the technique used over that 10 meters. And back to Dr. Galen for the results. Thank you, Dr. Bachman. So looking at the results, on the table that I'm showing here, we're showing the percentage difference between a standard wheelchair and an ultralight wheelchair. So when the value is negative, 
that means it took a little greater value in the ultralight wheelchair. So when you see those negative differences for roll forward and roll backward maneuvers, that means the time taken to do that with the uh, standard wheelchair was lesser compared to the ultralight wheelchair. But when we look at maneuverability, for example, how did they do a counterclockwise or clockwise turn? Those were significant for our uh, ultralight wheelchair because what happened is when somebody tries to turn counterclockwise or clockwise, they got displaced much greater with a standard wheelchair, whereas with the ultralight wheelchair, that displacement was lesser, which means in, when they're using their wheelchair, let's say in a home environment for them to turn around, they really need a very small footprint or area to execute that maneuver. And I'm showing the same data graphically to you on the right-hand side of the screen. So the two things that really stood out or were significant in this population was that maneuverability data of turning clockwise or counterclockwise. And then we also looked at in the uh, wheelchair propulsion test, the speed of propulsion, push frequency, and the effectiveness. And once again, with the standard wheelchair, the individuals were able to move slightly faster and hence the positive value. And the push frequency and the effectiveness were not significantly different. Again, we have graphically presented those data to you to show that there's not a lot of difference between the ultralight wheelchair and the standard wheelchair. So with that, the preliminary study that we have completed right now has demonstrated that it is feasible for us to use this testing protocol among individuals with stroke. And like I previously mentioned, we are currently collecting data with individuals with stroke and we hope to present it in the near future. And the preliminary results show that the maneuverability with an ultralight wheelchair is better compared to a standard wheelchair and hence moving in very small areas will be much better for our patients, hopefully. So the clinical relevance really from this research is that we hope the data we're collecting both with healthy as well as with our stroke individuals would provide clinical practitioners and also pair uh, sources with data to support the future of wheelchair use, especially when they need to recommend an individual to have a ultralight wheelchair to maximize their function and mobility. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please do email us. Our email details are provided on the poster. Thank you. Greetings from West Michigan. I would like to thank the ISS Conference Committee for the opportunity to present our poster entitled, A Qualitative Study of Stakeholder Perspectives of Pediatric Power Wheelchair Standing Devices. My name is Lisa Kenyon, and I'm honored to be presenting on behalf of our research team. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the families who have given their permission to show identifiable pictures of their children. Please protect the privacy of these children by avoiding taking or sharing any screenshots of the presentation. So first of all, what is a power wheelchair standing device? Simply put, it's a wheelchair, that, a power wheelchair, that allows a person to um, electronically transition between sitting and standing thereby affording access to the vertical plane and providing the opportunity to drive in either sitting or standing. Although power wheelchairs, standing devices have been around since uh, 2003 for children, very limited research has been published regarding these devices. And the research that has been published has been limited to children who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, so therefore boys who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. To begin the purpose of planning clinical trials focused on power wheelchair standing device use with other populations, other types of children, the purpose of our study was to explore and describe the experiences of various stakeholders regarding the use of standing power wheelchairs. We recruited participants from across the US uh, including four stakeholder groups, um, children who used a power wheelchair standing device, parents of children who used a power wheelchair standing device, rehabilitation professionals, and manufacturers of power wheelchair standing devices. Data were gathered via Zoom or in person in face-to-face -face interviews, and recruitment continued until data saturation was reached. Data were analyzed inductively using the constant comparative method and trustworthiness was addressed through the use of a reflexive journal 
member checks and inquiry audits. We had 35 participants that um, were interviewed in the study. As you can see by conducting our interviews via Zoom, we were able to really expand and recruit participants from multiple geographic areas across the US. Three themes emerged in the data, stand on demand, it's more than weight bearing, and ecosystems influencing power wheelchair standing device use. Let's briefly look at each of these themes. So in our first theme, all participants perceive the power wheelchair standing device as giving children the ability to stand when and where they desired, thereby increasing their independence and enhancing their participation in activities that range from performing in a school play to singing in a choir, playing with friends, working at a grocery store, participating in chem lab, and doing chores in the home and backyard. Participants also valued how standing and the ability to independently transition into standing allowed children to feel more involved in certain activities. As noted in this quote by Child 04, I like to stand at church when all the rest of the people are standing. It makes me feel like I really belong. Being able to stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance or during the national anthem were regarded as important activities enabled by power, power wheelchair standing device use. Participants also perceived a vast array of psychological benefits and psychosocial benefits arising from children's use of a power wheelchair standing device. Many felt standing in a power wheelchair standing device increased a child's confidence and allowed children to stand face to face with others, further in enhancing the potential to increase their self-concept. As noted by this quote, in my power wheelchair standing device, people can look at me eye to eye. And as little as that may seem, one of the main things in our society is eye contact. And not having eye contact is a constant barrier if I'm sitting down. Also within this theme, participants felt the ability to stand influenced how other people perceived a child, as is exemplified by this parent's quote. People assume a kid in a power wheelchair has cognitive difficulties, but they see my son standing in his power wheelchair standing device, looking at them face to face, and that assumption is diminished. The funding process and insurance issues were constantly mentioned as barriers to obtaining a power wheelchair standing device. In discussing her self-described fight for funding, parent 10 shared, our insurance company would only approve us for a power wheelchair, not for the standing feature. Parent 06 described a similar experience. Our insurance company kept coming back and saying, do you know how expensive this power wheelchair standing device is? Can't we do something a little less expensive? As with any study, there were limitations. The study reflected experience with power wheelchair standing devices in the US under the US healthcare system. And the age range and the duration of power wheelchair standing device use by the children in the study could have impacted our findings. Also, respondents may have responded to questions in a way that they felt was socially desirable. In conclusion, the ability to stand whenever and wherever a child wanted was unique to our wheelchair standing device use. Standing may increase children's feelings of belonging and funding was revealed as a barrier to power wheelchair standing device acquisition and use. Our findings has been published in a, an October um, 2021 issue of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. Here's our references. And if you have any questions, please contact me at kenyanli at gvsu.edu. Thank you for your time. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for stopping by our virtual poster called Inaccessible, a photo narrative journey of supportive mobility device use by people with cerebral palsy. My name is Heather Feldner, and I am presenting today on behalf of my co-authors, Deborah Gabler-Spira and Christy Bjornsson. To begin, supportive mobility devices, or SMDs, play an important role in the lives of people with cerebral palsy across the lifespan. However, 
little is really known about stakeholder perspectives of SMD on a broader scale, as well as their mobility priorities and how their mobility needs may change over time. So it's important to understand facilitators, barriers, and daily impacts of SMD use, because this is really important for uh, things like innovation and technology design, um, improvements in environmental accessibility, as well as improved shared decision-making in a timely manner between uh, people using devices and people prescribing them. And so the purpose of this study was to empower individuals with CP and or their caregivers as co-researchers to share their mobility stories and their SMD experiences across the lifespan using their own words and pictures. And so to do this, uh, we employed a participatory action research framework and specifically used a technique from that framework called photo voice. And with, with photo voice, each individual or family is given a research camera and a series of guiding questions, which they can choose to use or not, and asked to document meaningful aspects of their supportive mobility device use in this case. And we had a larger study um, of uh, over 100 participants across four US cities. And um, we engaged a subset of 25 of those participants to uh, participate in the photo voice portion of the study. And so this included individuals with CP, this included um, caregivers, and it um, included folks who were using uh, devices that were super complex all the way down to um, uh, fairly straightforward um, um, assistive technology. So some example questions that we used um, were things like take a photo of somewhere it's easy or hard to use your SMD, uh, show in pictures what your SMD helps you to do, um, what don't you like about your SMD, um, things like that. So again, the participants had complete freedom to decide whether they wanted to follow these questions or to take their own, as long as the um, subject of the, of the photo was meaningful for them in relation to their SMD experience. And so once uh, the photos were submitted back to us, we got together with the participants uh, remotely and had each participant select their favorite photos and narrate to us why they were important. And these narrations were uh, transcribed verbatim and used to then co-create themes. Our first theme, uh, which is the lightest purple, um, was the is the world is not built for us. And this dealt with accessibility challenges faced daily by people with CP using SMD, as well as the innovative solutions that they create as a result. The second theme, which is the uh, slightly darker shade of purple, is equipment should work for us, not against us. And here, um, partic participants noted challenges with SMD design and maintenance, as well as user design ideas for next generation technology. Finally, the third theme, which is shown in the darkest purple, is life is good with the right support. And this uh, dealt with uh, participants' perceptions of the importance of right place and right time SMD, and that was really critical in facilitating agency participation and enjoyment throughout the lifespan. So examples of the first theme here on the left-hand side of the poster show daily accessibility struggles, such as climbing stairs to a second story apartment, where the mother in this photo noted that on days that they have time, the process of her son getting upstairs with his walker takes between 10 and 15 minutes. Another family noted how inaccessible their back apartment entrance is and that the doorways, stairs, and size are common barriers when navigating life with SMD. Examples of the second theme uh, shown in the slightly darker purple toward the middle of the results section uh, show how different types of SMD allow different access, such as getting up close in a walker for horseback riding lessons when a powered wheelchair doesn't allow proximity. Photos also showed essential do-it-yourself, low technology so solutions custom created by families using things like zip ties, bungee cords, et cetera, to ensure seamless access to driving and communicating across multiple wheelchairs or other devices when no other available attachments had really worked as well for them. 
Finally, examples of the third theme, which again are in the darkest purple quotes, um, show how important SMD is to participation and life in general. Um, in these photos, we see a young adult discussing how her technology facilitates her independence and ability to stand. We, um, uh, we see um, a family talking about access and independence that goes beyond the device itself to also include the support and the supporting equipment, such as ramps and vans. Um, and these, um, despite their importance, are still out of, often out of pocket expenses. Um, and finally, how accessible environments in combination with uh, the right SMD at the right time were crucial for community participation. And in particular, this family was talking about their, um, their lift at their home. So in conclusion, while challenges are evident and relationships with SMD are complex, these devices are inherently valued and seen as opportunities to enhance participation across the lifespan. Um, further, participatory photographic methods such as these are both accessible and visually compelling in sharing the stories and the voices of SMD users with CP. Um, and this work will um, inform some of our future work. And what we hope to do is to create a large scale, large scale North American survey um, across the lifespan for people with CP with the goal of creating a shared decision-making algorithm for SMD use um, in the future. Thanks so much for listening.